Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy Jaw, your host, and I have Adam here as my co-host. Andy, we're going to do something a little different tonight. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so some really big news in the information security community this week. Chris Krebs, the Director of Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, was fired by tweet by the President of the United States. And this was a big thing because he is our top cybersecurity professional in the U.S. government. And just a little bit about Chris Krebs, if you don't know who he is or where this agency came from, he was confirmed by Congress as the Undersecretary of Homeland Security for the National Protections and Program Directorate. And when that changed to CISA, he stayed on as its first director. So he's the first director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And he was fired for essentially debunking election fraud claims. On November 12th, CISA put out a statement, and I'll put a link in the show notes to this, but it basically stated that the November 3rd election was the most secure in American history, and right now across the country, election officials are reviewing and double-checking the entire election process prior to finalizing this result. And his agency had multiple campaigns and collaborated with several agencies across the government to combat disinformation and protect voter locations, both physically and digitally, including an offensive campaign weeks before the election to try and disrupt and counteract Iranian state actors. Was Microsoft involved with that as well, or was that a different effort? I know Microsoft had been involved in some efforts to prevent election tampering as well. And and there were a couple of press releases on that, although I'm kind of fuzzy on the details. Was that in collaboration here with this government agency, or was that a separate thing? Do you know? I think it, it was a part of the entire campaign. They probably didn't release public details of where the collaboration ended, but I'm sure CISA was aware of Microsoft's efforts and probably helped along with that Mm -hmm. in Microsoft's cyber criminal, uh, what is it called? Digital Crimes Unit. Digital Crimes Unit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why I really wanted to have this be our focal point for this week was, you know, as I was browsing on the InfoSec Twitter, I've never seen the information security community be so galvanized in their support around one individual as they did with Chris Krebs. He really performed, you know, under impossible conditions, was underappreciated in the face of overwhelming odds, and really succeeded on defending our democracy. It is just a monumental accomplishment. And so we wanted to just take a moment to recognize him as a veteran. You know, I wanted to say that he is a true patriot and that our country is safer because of his service. You know, there's a a terminology that's used to describe people who work in government, and it's public servant. And sometimes the meaning of that has become lost or uh, misused. But I think for somebody like this, who could have made a fortune in private sector and did work for very large private sector companies like Microsoft, to go to public service and to work, like you said, in very challenging conditions against very determined threat actors and to succeed so greatly is is truly the definition of public service and and totally agree country is better off because of chris krebs and and absolutely there is no greater patriotism than public service so a couple of things came to mind as this incident happened this week that are kind of related but oftentimes as cybersecurity professionals we often fear that if there is an incident that we may get terminated because of that, because we didn't do our jobs. Now, that's not what happened to Chris Krebs, but that kind of prompted my thought process into how we kind of view the security of our jobs, really. You know, we've talked about how high stress this job may be because we're always worried about the different vulnerabilities. A phrase that's often used is what keeps you up at night when it's posed to CISOs. And so even when you climb higher and higher on the corporate ladder, I think those stresses of making sure that the company is safe get harder and harder. And so I was just thinking about that and whether it's right or wrong to terminate a CISO or 
someone in the cybersecurity department if there is a breach. Chief Information Security Officer stands for Chief Information Scapegoat Officer, right? <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's a great question. And and let me even broaden the conversation a little bit before we dive into that. And, and we can kind of take this all on together. You know how when there's a breach at a company and you get the letter in the mail that says, we take your privacy seriously, or we take the security of inf your information seriously. At the same time, they're telling you they just got breached. Now, we know as InfoSec professionals, assume breach, everyone's going to get breached, you know, limit the scope of the breach, etc. But that feels hollow when companies write that. And I have seen some people suggest, should there be more criminal liability when a company has a breach and loses control of your sensitive personal information. And let's tie that kind of all back together and, and kind of have a broader discussion there, because I think, I think there's some interesting conversation to have around. Sometimes it feels like there's a lack of consequences when there is a breach at a big company today. In fact, it feels like they're so frequent anymore that even the outrage of them has, has become almost minimal. You know you're going to get a letter in the mail. There's going to be a class action suit, and you're going to get eight dollars and ninety three cents if you you know send in the postcard, and you're going to get two years of credit monitoring. Like you know, rinse and repeat. At this point, should there be more liability if you get breached beyond just getting terminated? I, I'm kind of curious about that because I, I have thoughts both ways. I want to see companies be better stewards of my information, but at the same time, I don't know if it's always fair to have somebody lined up as a scapegoat when something that is darn near inevitable at this point inevitably happens. And where is the line between, well, this breach wasn't that bad because we contained it and they didn't get into anything um, versus this one was really horrific. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that, Andy. Yeah, I think it'd be tough to put some sort of criminal charge on that, I would certainly fear it because I know that it is inevitable that you're going to get breached. I think there's a line between what we've often talked about on this podcast, which is the balance between risk and the business and accepting risk and putting mitigation controls in place. And then the other side of that would be negligence or ignorance or even incompetence when it comes to protecting information. So as I was looking across and trying to think about this topic, one incident did come to mind and I, it was so rare because it rarely happens, but I remember and I found the article, which I'll, I'll put a link to it in the show notes, of a director of IT getting fired because his company suffered an attack from ransomware. You know, as we've talked about, it is our jobs to brief the decision makers, or if you are the decision maker, it's your job to weigh the risks of what your security analysts are telling you. This is what could happen if you don't put this mitigating risk in place. And oftentimes that decision comes down to whether or not there's going to have some sort of significant user impact or business impact or even financial impact, whether or not you're going to implement that control. And if you're not, you're accepting that risk. Your question on whether or not there should be some sort of punishment, you know, I certainly don't think the folks in the InfoSec department or in that community should be held at fault unless it was, you know, criminal fault on, on their part if they actually initiated it or, you know, allowed it to happen. But if they've done their due diligence and identified the risks, tried to put mitigating controls in place, I certainly don't think they should be held criminally liable for something like that. Financially liable as a company, definitely, but not criminally. And from the point of executives, I would say, you know, they should be held to a higher standard because they're the ones that are making the decision. It's funny that you should say CISO is the chief information scapegoat or whatever you called it, because I hadn't heard that one before. But I think that's what it often ends up being is that the blame is put on them versus the CEO or whoever, you know, the executive board taking responsibility, because I'm sure a good CISO would have notified them, informed them of the risk, gave them enough information so that they were the one making the decision and accepting what risk and what mitigations to put in place. I think everything you said is spot on, but I will play contrarian on one point. You talk about, and we talk about on the show all the time, the need to educate on risk to the business and inform decision makers, and then they make an educated decision on what level of risk they're willing to accept. And that is all true. Totally agree with that. My point is 
the risk appetite is increasing with time because these breaches are becoming less and less and less of a big deal. You don't even really lose much value in your stock anymore. I used to have customers tell me, you know, we're so worried about it because the reputation hit is horrible. We're going to lose 30% of the value in our stock, which equals to this many dollars. So therefore we need to do everything we can to prevent against that happening. Like anymore, like it's a dime a dozen when there's a, another breach. And so I think the risk appetite is increasing over time. And, you know, I am by no means not a big fan of, of increasing onerous regulation here, but the risk appetite becomes different if the risk becomes comes criminal proceedings if if you did not take enough care and diligence to protect your organization you know that's when it becomes wow we really need to invest in our information security department and staff up and buy more tools because the risk is so great to the organization and to its people if we don't i mean companies do this all the time with compliance related risks where you must be compliant or else kind of thing happens. They'll do everything to be compliant. There is no anything that gets in the way of it. And so I'm just wondering, as I am seeing the risk diminish for organizations, if there's a way instead we could increase the risk to companies to incent them as they're making those educated decisions to take more mitigating steps. Do I think it's reasonable to be at zero breaches ever? Of course not. And I think we need to change our language and even how we think about it because part of a modern security strategy is you're going to get little breaches all the time. The important part is not letting them progress, not not getting breached at all. If somebody breaks into Janie's email account, hopefully there's nothing interesting in there because Janie's been storing secure information in another platform that is more secured or something like that. And so there is no lateral movement. There's no exfiltration of data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to see maybe that balance of risk change a little bit so there is more incentive to invest more. Because I feel like as a consumer today, not taking off my information security professional hat and putting on my consumer hat, I feel like there is so little incentive anymore for companies to invest in information security and do the right thing. And that's become very frustrating with the frequency of breaches. Yeah, I can see your point there. I'm being contrarian on purpose, by the way, but I'm I'm just trying to to be contrarian to illustrate a larger point. I really hope we're not going down that path where we're just becoming so numb to the fact that we're having all these breaches and we just kind of put up our hand and say, well, there's nothing that we can do about it. I think that there is some differences in the breaches because the media or how it is, gets reported, it just says that there's a breach. But there's a difference between getting your names and maybe your addresses, your phone numbers, that sort of stuff, which through a lot of open source intelligence can be gathered anyways. That versus, say, getting your social security numbers or PHI data, your you know mental health records. Like there was an incident in one of the Scandinavian countries where it just came to light that the company was breached actually years ago and mental health records were obtained by the attackers. And the attackers are now actually going to the patients and holding them ransom saying that we have your doctor's notes, your notes with your psychiatrist, and we know that you are suffering from depression. We know that you are suffering from these kind of thoughts or, or that you had this type of illness. And we're going to put that on the public data sphere if you don't pay us. I mean, that's some some really sadistic stuff. But you know that level of access and data breach is much, much different than if they were to get my name, my address, and you know my, my driver's license even. I think from a a level of breach there's certainly some segregation that can be put in place to say you know the severity of each breach and then put some sort of monetary penalty because i think when it comes to companies if it's not criminal certainly a monetary fine would get their attention and if you're talking about say 25 percent of their budget as a fine for a phi breach or a, uh, a hipaa violation or something like that that will certainly get their attention right Absolutely. That that incense a lot of good behavior with GDPR. I forget what the thresholds are for that, for penalties for GDPR, but absolutely it has incented a ton of behavior and driven a ton of investment in being compliant with that. And again, I, I get there's a difference between a compliance regulation and a cybersecurity regulation, but it's, it's just something interesting I, I'm just thinking about as, as I got a letter in the mail the other day. And it, it, you know, it just gets old. And I, I understand both sides. I mean, certainly I do. Um, I'm just trying to think of a way where we can change that balance and, and maybe make it more favorable for everyone. 
The other point that I wanted to talk about that I saw this week on Twitter as the Chris Krebs episode was happening in real time was there were some folks who went and looked at his background and because he has a bachelor's degree in environmental studies and he has a law degree that they kind of basically said he wasn't qualified to be the director of CISA and I really think that I wanted to emphasize that this is a fallacy that people need to have some sort of technical experience or technical degree to be an InfoSec. We've talked about this in previous episodes, but we need to stop assuming this, that it's it's a toxic type of idea where if you're not technical, if you're not a coder, if you don't have any technical experience, that you cannot be an InfoSec. Anyone can be an InfoSec. And certainly as you climb the corporate ladder, it becomes less and less about your technical acumen. It becomes about management and people and and communication skills. University programs have so little direct technical connection to real world scenarios. And that is by design. That's intentional. And it's a good thing. I went through what would be considered a technical bachelor's degree. I I have a management information systems degree from Iowa State University. And certainly, I did have a couple of classes where, you know, I specifically coded in Java. But really, the point was not to teach me Java. It was to teach me how to write computer code. Or I had a database class. And yes, we had an environment that was like an Oracle system of some kind. But the purpose of that was not to teach me Oracle. It was to teach me how a relational database works. And the whole idea that you would need some specific training, especially university training, is laughable. Uh, The most important thing to know is how to think about it. And I would argue the most important thing in information security today is going to be diversity of thought, diversity of ideas. We need more diversity in information security because the attackers are incredibly diverse. They're geographically distributed around the world. They're from all different countries. They practice all sorts of different religions. They're men, they're women, they're young, they're old. And and the idea that we only need a certain class of people to work in this business is really just not true at all. And I think people who come from diverse backgrounds are going to bring such interesting thought processes to defend organizations or to defend the United States as the case we're talking about here. I would want to see law degrees. I would want to see psychology degrees, criminal studies, music majors. Sure, why not? I want diversity of thought, diversity of opinion in my cybersecurity defenders because the attackers are incredibly diverse. And if we're not going to be, we will have incredible blind spots that will prevent us from protecting our country and our organizations appropriately. One of the most interesting things I read about this was one person commented on a thread that I saw and said, when you're getting into information security, you should take a look at different breaches and different stories about InfoSec and understand why the community exists to begin with and why we do the things we do. It's like understanding the mission of information security. And if you can get behind that, that's the most important part of it because everything we do kind of builds on that, right? Why do we have an identity provider? Why do we have encryption? Why do we have endpoint protection? And if you're able to answer that as part of the information security mission, which is you're trying to protect the identities, you're trying to protect the data, you want to make sure that attackers can't read the data if they get the data, you know, those sorts of things, then that's the most important thing. And you don't need a technical degree to understand the mission and to think like a defender or an information security professional. A lot of people don't even have degrees who are in information security. They just have certifications. I think degrees and certifications, what the most important thing that they do is if you are doing something like that in InfoSec, it tells you the areas that you may be interested in or areas that you need to work on. I think certs and degrees are important in the fact that they give you this broad stroke of the whole field and you're able to kind of identify a a part of information security that you're interested in, whether it be, say, pen testing or enterprise defense or malware analysis or threat intelligence. What was really interesting, I was on a, a Zoom call just prior to this podcast, Adam, where it was this organization called VetSec, and it was a bunch of veterans who are interested in the industry of information security, and a lot of them come from Army Signal Intelligence, and 
a lot of the conversation in the beginning was about threat intelligence and gathering threat intel because that's what the military does. They gather threat intelligence and feed that to analysts to analyze to make sure that they have the right intel in the field so that their soldiers and their their airmen, their marines are attacking the right targets. They have the right risk mitigated, which is very different than what we generally talk about on this podcast, which is enterprise defense. But that's a whole different field of infosec that is valid that you don't need a technical degree to do. You just need to be able to think in a certain way. And the attitude just comes from understanding the entire mission of InfoSec. There's been a trend with the Silicon Valley companies recently to remove requirements for formal degree programs from their job postings. So Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft to a lesser extent actually, have removed the necessity to have a four-year degree to even apply or get in the door to their programs, which I think is great because that became a very lazy HR trope to filter candidates without having to really look at them any deeper. It just became a way to do that first call and throw away a whole bunch of resumes because nope, no four-year degree, don't look at them. And thankfully, we are starting to move past that, especially at the big Silicon Valley companies where you can absolutely apply and absolutely be considered without any sort of formal post-secondary education. So I think that's a great move as well. And certainly that applies to information security as well. When you think of all of the resources available just on the web, just on Twitter, just everywhere in social media, it's really incredible what you can gain access to today. I had a customer who we had done an overview of Azure AD today. And afterwards, they said, can we get some training material? And the answer forever and ever has always kind of been no. You know, we don't we don't really have formal training material on a specific product. And, and now at Microsoft Learn, we have very in-depth training on all sorts of different products. And product-specific knowledge is not a replacement for general knowledge. I'm not saying it is. But just as an example of what is out there today, there is now a three and a half hour course in Azure AD. It's on Microsoft Learn. It's completely free. You can go take it. You can finish it. You can put a badge on your LinkedIn profile that says you've been through the Microsoft Learn program for identity and access management. And there's all sorts of stuff like that out there. That's just one example, but so many opportunities to get hands-on with technology, spin up demo environments, get training directly from the vendor, get YouTube videos. It's just incredible if you're motivated to break into a business, what you can do. And especially with the fact that this business is so young, it's so new. Information security is still a very new practice. And it doesn't have years of experience. It doesn't have a body of work that's been built up over decades or centuries. And so we're all learning how to do it at the same time. We're all learning what this industry should look like long term. And that's the great thing about it is so many of the practitioners today come from such diverse backgrounds. And you can be an excellent cybersecurity practitioner like Chris Krebs, regardless of your background. And a degree and a certification, I mean, that's just kind of one way to demonstrate competency. And arguably, sometimes you can get those even without being competent. It's just one thing to display to say, I have this base level of knowledge and I am able to do this job. There are other ways to prove that, though, as well. I mean... As Adam said, there's so many other resources out there nowadays, but you know, you could have a, a GitHub full of your own code. You could publish your blogs. And what's great about the InfoSec community is that you don't have to have a doctorate in information security to be published. You just put out your blog and say what you want to say, and it can be extremely useful to the community. You could put out a podcast about information security. I think the point is, we really need to get out of the practice of saying that just because they're not technical, they didn't have come from a technical background, that they're not qualified to be in information security, especially at the management level. You don't need to be technical to be up there. Now, you need to understand, like I said, the mission of information security, why we're here, how to evaluate risk. But certainly anyone can be in this, this industry. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. There's a link in the show notes to our voicemail. Leave us a voicemail or send us a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn if there's a security topic you want us to talk about or ask our opinion on. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys later. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.